Hello and welcome to another Mount View Live. I'm Neil Rutherford and for those of you I haven't met yet, I'm Industry Liaison Manager at Mount View. I hope you're all keeping safe and well. Our guest today is nothing short of fabulous. You know and love him best for his Strictly Judging on Strictly Come Dancing, but he is so much more than that. A choreographer, a director, a performer, a novelist, an artist, a sculptor, a chef, a conductor, a cameraman, a hairdresser. We could literally go on for hours and hours and hours. I had the great pleasure of working on his glorious production of Sunset Boulevard when we transferred it from the Watermill to the Comedy Theatre, now the Pinter Theatre. And I got to see firsthand that he's not only one of the hardest working people I've met, but also I got to see why he's widely regarded as one of the most honest, genuine, talented, supportive, and hilarious members of our industry. Please welcome Mr. Craig Revel Horwood. Well, thank you so much, darling. Hello, what, love. Is Gavin what, out of the job? What a wonderful, in, what a wonderful intro, darling. <laughs> Waiting for the curtains to rise, you know. If we had them, big double COVID. doors to walk through. <laughs> I can give you a tissue. That's about the best we can do in COVID. Yeah, that's right. fine. That'll do me. Um, lovely to see you, and thank you so much for giving up your time. It's really, really great to see you today. Um, You're welcome. I've talked there about the many, many hats that you wear, and of course we'll be we'll be going through through those in the time that we've got. But can we go back to Australia, to Ballarat, where mm. you spent most of your childhood, and what those inspirations were, sort of getting you those foundations of, of your love for the industry? Well, it's I none of my family really were in the theatre, and I was born I born in Ballarat, in the state of Victoria. People don't know where that is. It's about a hour and a half's drive from Melbourne and uh, born there but didn't really spend that much time there because my father was in the Navy and of course that meant every two years we would move, change schools. So I started school for instance, we came to uh, live in Fareham over in this country near Portsmouth because uh, my father obviously was doing his uh, training in the Navy for officer training and that had to be done in those days. Uh, there. So uh, I started school in this country and that's how I know about plimsolls and things like that. <laughs> and we spent two years here, then we got the posting back to Australia, went back to Ballarat of course and uh, then kept moving around. So six years uh, of my life were lived in Sydney and that's where uh, my dad was training at uh, Watson's Bay or had become an officer and working in the Navy there. And of course I changed schools every two years. So I didn't really make any friends at any schools. And that's probably what led me to want to do something uh, that was to do with other people, you know, rather because I hated sport at school and I was a fat little kid as well. <laughs> By the time we came back from Sydney, I was in year nine. So I'd spent year seven and, uh, year eight in uh, my first uh, days of uh, first two years at high school up in Sydney and then uh, we went and I was at a boys school then we went and that's where I uh, fell in love with music of course it was 1977 so disco fever was upon us Saturday Night Fever had just come out of course and the idea of being able to dance like John Travolta was <laughs> like amazing so uh, and all the boys in the playground who used to play handball and all these butch sort of sports were all trying to do John Travolta's moves. <laughs> and I was fascinated. There was one guy, I just said, I went up to him, he's in the playground sort of doing, you know, this disco stuff. And I just said, how do you do that? Can you please teach me how to do that? And then I had a fascination. I didn't know it was a fascination. I didn't know it was going to become something that I would want to do as a living. But I certainly loved it. I had great joy watching it and trying to do it. And, uh, and I studied at school, uh, the recorder, like most people. Then I went on to uh, the trumpet and into brass instruments, the tenor horn, the French horn, and I was studying that. And then when I got to my, uh, back to Ballarat, my hometown where I was born, from Sydney, which was a big city, obviously, yeah. and I moved to a country town and into a co-ed school where the girls were butchered than the guys uh, and bashed you up. I mean, they were vile. I mean, I just, I was so aggressive. I couldn't actually believe it because I was quite, believe it or not, 
quite a pretty young thing and I did look <laughs> like a girl and didn't develop until really late you know so um it, and I put on weight because I was short as well I'm six foot two now but back then I was short the shortest in the class everyone had testosterone and I didn't I think I had estrogen and um, and then uh, and then I I won a colouring in competition. This is all leading to dance, by the way. I did <laughs> a competition, a colouring in competition at 13, which was really uh, the limit for anyone to enter. But I entered because my little sisters were entering it. And I won this dance, uh, disastrous thing. And it was a huge chocolate Easter egg. And um, I had to go and collect it at the local you know, shopping centre. And it was presented to me with this big, great big bear or something, you know, someone in a furry outfit. And I was on the front page of the Ballarat Courier. And I had to deliver myself in the morning, then go to school. Then I was ribbed like you would not believe. I mean, I was teased anyway for having long black eyelashes. Everyone said I wore mascara. The girls would stop me in the corridor, belt me against, you know, um, loads of various you know lockers and things like that blocking my locker I could never get to it I hated school and hated everything about it and that was year nine and year ten um and I didn't want to continue and also I ate this huge easter egg and I came back after the easter break and I put on even more weight so the PE teacher said oh my god Craig you've put on so much weight um you're gonna now in shame run around the oval in front of the whole class with your top off and I did and from that moment everyone started calling me tits because I had little boy boobs and um, so I was devastated I mean I can look back and laugh now because I've made something yeah myself but uh, when you're I wanted you know to lose weight it forced me to think I hate sport I just don't like sport I was into music I was in the school orchestra I was a bit of a nerd like that, I, but I always wanted to go on the stage, but my sister always got the roles. And plus they always needed me in the orchestra. So uh, there was no way that I was ever allowed on the stage at the school. So uh, the trumpet, Amanda next to me, she was trumpet one, I was trumpet two. And I was complaining and saying, everyone's teasing me about being fat and everyone's teasing me about and calling me tits. And um, she said, well, I go to a, you know, an exercise class every Thursday night, if you want to come. And so I went to this ex exercise class and it just happened to be a jazz ballet class. I didn't know that. I wore a pair of jeans. I ended up being chafed, like you wouldn't believe, because I <laughs> hated any physical activity. But the funny thing was, I could pick it up and I loved it. I was dancing. Well, I was moving to music. It was more like Jane Fonda's workout. And, um, and then I just could do it and I was loving it, thinking, wow, this is really great. And uh, so I went back the following week, this time in a tracksuit, which was much better, and then uh, continued that. And it was run by the Ballarat uh, Lyric Theatre, which is an Amdram theatre company in uh, my hometown of Ballarat. And they said, oh, would you be interested in joining the Ballarat Lyric Theatre and becoming one of the dancers in it, like performers in it? Obviously, we will train you up and you'll learn routines and then you go on stage and do all of that. And um, I said, yeah, that sounds like fun. And plus, I love the people I was with. I was hated at school. I hated everyone at school. I was literally, people were waiting for me underneath the Caledonian Bridge to bash me up. But I don't know why. I mean, just because I was probably a little bit effeminate and uh, looked like a girl, you know, and I, I probably looked powerless, so they pick on those sort of people. But, um, you know, I braved school, hated it, went to these classes, loved it, loved it, loved it. The teacher said, you need to start taking some classical ballet classes. I said, oh, no, no, that's, that's sort of going a little bit too far. And, um, and then I eventually did. I eventually got my bum into a jock strap, which I was really scared about because I've never had anything put up my backside like that before. <laughs> I mean, I love it now, obviously, but um, <laughs> back then it was a bit of a challenge. And plus, I kept it a secret from everybody uh, at school because I would have been teased. I mean, one kid at our school, for instance, had a perm and uh, had to leave the school because he got teased so violently. I mean, it was just awful. So you could never tell anyone you were doing class studying classical ballet after school. 
So, um, I mean, it'd be fine if you're playing football, but I hated all that. So um, the beauty was I went to these um, classical classes. I did a show, which I absolutely loved. I loved the people around me. I respected them. They were a lot older. I was probably, I don't know, 15, something like that. Uh, and I fell in love with it. And then my teachers really pushed me to want to go further. Obviously, I was nervous. Obviously, I was scared of committing to a, a life of dance. I just thought, oh, I'm going to end up like one of those Nancy boys, you know, in, in the ballet. And I just thought, oh, I, I really, I can't. I was nervous of making that leap and that decision. Um, but the beauty was, it was escapism for me. It was, my father was an alcoholic and I had an abusive father in a horrible home to go back to. As much as I loved my, you know, my sisters and my brother and, and my mum, my father was a nightmare to come home to. So, uh, and I didn't get on with him particularly well. And I just knew that he wouldn't really approve of that sort of, you know, thing. So it was all in secret. And, um, and I felt when I was looking in the mirror dancing that I forgot everything and, I loved, instead of playing the music, being able to move to the music, I obviously lost weight. I shot up to six foot two in literally four months and everything changed. And I decided that that's what I wanted to do. And so I left school uh, and left home at 15 and a half and I decided to, um, I just got any job I could because I didn't like school. And that was where the cooking came in. I became an apprentice chef. I hated that because Darren, the head chef, was a nightmare, an absolute hell on earth. I mean, abusive, calling me names. I mean, it was worse than school because it was grown-ups doing it to me this time. And I just went, oh, this is awful. And then a TV celebrity walked in to find out who had been doing the... Um, who had been doing the desserts. And Susie Quattro, I remember, was in the restaurant at the time that I was working in. And I've since worked with her and I told her this story actually, while I sat next to her because we judged um, the best Elvis or something on TV. And I went, Susie Quattro, you won't believe this story. You came, I made your dessert, you know, when I was like 15. So um, that was a pleasure and a thrill. And then he offered me a job at the TV station, the local TV station, which was be the, be, um, uh, B to B6 um, in Ballarat and I became a TV cameraman I became a sound recordist for the um, for the news team I spent six months doing that which is amazing I was training all the time that I was doing this of course continuing my jazz ballet contemporary classical and uh, performing in you know and rehearsing because Amdram takes six months of course to rehearse and uh, then I sort of got the bug and decided that's what I wanted to do for a vocation. So I used all of these other jobs really uh, as an ultimate, sort of as a penultimate sort of thing to, or a, a springboard to dance and um, continued my training. I'd, and then I'd sort of run out of training um, possibilities in my hometown of Ballarat. And then I was told, I really should go to Melbourne. And a new school had opened up in Melbourne, the Tony Bartuccio School of, um, of, well, it was the first school of its kind uh, where you learn theatre, you learn acting, you know, you'll do an acting thing, you'll do a, you'll do a tap course, you'll do a classical, it was to encompass everything, vocals, you know, uh, singing, everything. It's just sort of a, the first ever musical theatre course like Mount View. And, um, and you know, I was heavily based on dance and they had their own agency. So at 17, I was while I was um, while I was I was hairdressing just to pay the rent, by the way. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how I got that. Actually, I've just applied for a job. I went and got some books from the library, flicked through them, learned a bit of the Dal Sassoon, um, learned the jargon, went in and said, oh, I've always been passionate about hair, which is a whole load of rubbish. But um, I bluffed my way into that got an apprenticeship, kept my training up, joined an Amdram theatre company in Melbourne. And my first show in Melbourne was a show called Little Me with Maggie Kirkpatrick. I don't know whether you know her. She was yes, of course, from Business yeah. Elbow Page. And um, I thought, right, I made it. This is fantastic. And uh, I was hairdressing, as I say, to pay the rent. And so it was hard to juggle 
the hairdressing because that was full time and then every evening trying to keep up the dance and getting time off to go to rehearsals etc but I managed it and um, then I had an audition for a show called West Side Story and I auditioned for that I never really thought anything else about it and continued to hairdress and then I got a phone call one morning saying oh um, we'd like to offer you a job in West Side Story, which was, I went to see that show and I went, oh my God, this is amazing. Like Sharita Costa's in it. I don't know, no one's probably ever heard of her, but she's <laughs> uh, Australia's answer to Darcy Bustle. <laughs> and she was like a prima ballerina, but she was in like this amazing production, yeah. which was all punk and completely sort of changed. It was all triple turns to the knee. And, uh, and I got this job and I couldn't believe it. So I had to get out of my indentures, of course. You're signed for three years and locked in. Yeah. So I had to go in and plead with uh, the woman who owns the hairdressing salon to release me. And she said, my sister did the same thing, please. <laughs> and failed miserably. Can I just give you this advice, please? Please, you're a talented hairdresser. I can see you as a colorist. I can see you, you know, um, you know, becoming Vidal Sassoon. And I said, but Zintra, darling, I, I've been offered West Side Story. Please, please, please release me. Anyway, she said, be it on your head. You won't have a qualification. You won't be able ever to go back to hairdressing. I said, I know, but I have to try. And I was just about to turn 18. And... I thought, if I don't do it now, I'll never do it. And this is like the best job ever I'll ever have in my life, probably. And the first paying job. I mean, it paid me quadruple in cash what I was getting, you know, as a hairdresser with $99 a week, you know. Yeah. So uh, I said, she, let, she released me, long and short of it. I went in, my opening night, I mean, I loved the rehearsal period, but my opening night, the closing notice went up on the board. The show was closing in two weeks. So <laughs> A two week job, but it was like the best, you know, and uh, I thought it was amazing. I auditioned immediately after and then got other shows and then yeah. never stopped working as a dancer until uh, I was 30, actually. And that's what started it. Yeah. I did shows all the way up until um, I was 23 in Australia and trying to branch out, doing TV ads, doing a bit more acting. I tried to um, up the game from dance to singing. I tried to develop my voice. At all this time that I was working, I always did a Russian ballet class between the hours of nine and midday, no and matter what, no matter what. I had one day off a week and that was Sunday. Even when if I was working, auditioning, I would still go to those classes because I knew I still had to keep training and still had to develop my skills. And obviously I had to keep working on my singing. I couldn't tap for shit. So I had to keep trying to tap. I don't know, something in my head was not telling my feet what to do. I don't know why I couldn't tap, but um, who knew, you know, that you can, if with perseverance, you can get there. So uh, my career was great actually in Australia, but I wanted something more and that's why I moved and to Paris. And then you came by Paris and finally got to London. Um, yeah, absolutely. And did some incredible shows. Um, we talked earlier about the, the hat wearing, and it's something certainly in my industry classes, the students get so uh, so frustrated. I'm constantly going about wearing hats because it's both resilience, um, but also longevity of career. The fact you can yeah. jump into lots of different things, and that's something you've done innumerable times. How well, did the how did the director choreograph um, work come from you being a performer, which is what started in the West End as a performer? Yeah. How did that happen? Well. I was dancing up until I was 29 and about to turn 30. And I felt that that was a landmark. I remember I was in a show at the time. I'd done Cats in the West End, Miss Saigon. I went from that into Crazy For You. And this was 1994. I decided to do one year of that show between 93 and 94 and only sign for one year. Uh, because it's so easy in the West End to get caught in long-term contracts and not develop yourself. And I, want, I wanted more. I mean, I loved being in Miss Saigon. I loved the acting. I loved the singing. I loved the dancing. I loved the show. It was emotional. I moved to a show called Crazy View, which was all tap. Mm -hmm. So I had to improve my tap. I mean, Susan Stroman said, Greg, I'd really love you to be dance captain, but honey, 
your tap sucks. <laughs> I went, I know. Stro, I promise I will work on it. And I did. She said, do all Barbie's tassets, honey, and we'll look. So one lunchtime, I mean, I trained like a bitch to do that. And literally every morning at eight o'clock, I was in there tap dancing. And I managed to do all of his stuff. I showed it to her one lunch hour and she said, yeah, you got the job. So I became dance captain of that. That led to my relationship with Stro, which leads to me wanting to do more, wanting to be like her. I loved her. She inspired me. She had a great sense of humor. Mm. And I thought, I think that's what I want to do. I don't know whether I'd be any good at it because of course not everyone that is a dancer, a singer, actor or whatever is going to be a good choreographer. Right. So uh, I just loved the way she worked, got on really, really well with her. And she then- She took it away as well, didn't she? Yeah, but the, um, what happened was I did my year contract on um, Crazy For You. Uh, Ruthie and I, Ruthie Henshaw and I were meant to go to Australia and Cameron McIntosh was going to, um, was going to, you know, uh, produce it in yeah. Australia. And he wanted Ruthie in there and me as dance captain to help put it on and stuff like that. Uh, which I said, fine, great. Then that fell through, didn't it? And the money was pulled and it didn't happen. And Ruthie and I were out of a job. Ruthie's job had gone to Helen Way, who was now Charlie King. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, we had no job. So I was jobless for three months and had to pay the rent Hence, that's why I did sculpting. I did art, just, and I got an art agent, I mean, just to pay the rent. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, the gold phone at uh, my house, the Heartbreak Hotel in Camden Town, which I've just written a book about, of course, a novel. Um, the phone rang and it was Stro saying, hi, Craig, uh, do you want to come? Can you come? Are you free? I said, yes. And she said, because I, I was starting to train uh, as an actor. I thought, right, I'm not dancing anymore. I'm going to be a straight actor. I'm going to scrub dance off my CV. No one ever thinks of you, you know, if you're a dancer, I thought no one's ever going to think of me seriously as an actor. So I, I joined the actor center, paid a lot of money to do all these classes. And then the phone rang, Stro said, can you come to uh, Broadway on Monday? I need you to teach the Broadway company and then take, uh, the, and then join the American Touring Company of it in Washington. And then I want you to take the show to Berlin, be in it, and dance captain. There'll be two dance captains. I went to learn from Stacey, Todd Holt, his name was. And we had tap challenges. We did, I mean, the Americans were amazing. I mean, they were just fierce. I, I had to really pull my weight to, to match them in the tap dancing, um, you know, area. And uh, fell in love with tap, fell in love with Americans, fell in love with the musical. And then she said, uh, now you've done all, you've had all these experiences. I'd like you to put the show on by yourself in South Africa. And that's when I put the show on. Then Cameron got wind of that show that I put on and asked me and invited me back to Miss Saigon, but this time as resident director, to replace Matt Ryan. And, that's where it all changed. And then I loved that training under Matt. And then, uh, and then I was offered a show called Matangue uh, to uh, you know, assist on the choreography for that with Bob Avon, which won, of course, uh, an Olivier Award. Uh, the show didn't do so well, but you know, the choreography won the Olivier Award. And then I thought, this is what I really like doing. And then for seven years, I was a sort of theatre doctor for Cameron Macintosh and uh, went in to fix stuff, you know, put shows on and cast stuff, all of that. and loved that life. And then I decided to go out alone. And that was sort of scary because I left Cameron, or Cameron kicked me out, actually, <laughs> the truth of the matter. And Stephen Meir got my job. Not that I'm bitter, darling. Everything's for a reason. And you have to remember that because once you're in the dance gutter, the only way up is to brush oneself off and then, you know, fly forward with or without a mobile phone that I couldn't afford at the time. <laughs> and uh, I went down from, I don't know, 35,000 a year to 9,000, you know, it was quite difficult, but I thought this is what I want to do. So that's what I did. And my first job was at Chichester Festival Theatre doing a show called Pal Joey. And I had rave reviews for that. Thank I didn't know where it might lead. I mean, I was paid literally 500 quid to choreograph it because there was all small budget. I'd never been heard of, you know. So, um, so I took the risk and it paid off and I just loved it. They felt so guilty when they saw the show 
the Watermel Theatre that they gave me another £500 because they said, oh, it's very dance heavy, this show. I said, yeah, there's not a lot of direction in it. I've got to say, darling, it's a huge dance show because it was built around Gene Kelly, for goodness sake. So, uh, yeah, it was wall-to-wall dance. And uh, because of that, I was the producers were coming up to me left, right and centre, offering me jobs. And, mm-hmm. and then I became a choreographer. And the slip into direction, uh, I worked with a lot of people that I loved, you know, from Cheek by Jowl, uh, Donlan, who was amazing, uh, Nick Heidner. You know, I le- learned from, you know, a wealth of wonderful directors. Yeah. And, um, and that's why I, do, you know, I can't do a dance routine without a story. You know, I, I don't know where to start. No, it's incredibly it has, important story for you, isn't it? I mean, it's... Well, it has to be, because what's the reason? Why is the reason that you're dancing? Yeah. You know, you've got to have a story. And if there isn't one, I have to create one out of the scene yeah. that goes into dance. I mean, the directors have it easy, only because everything is in the script. Yeah. Oh, this is what they do. Oh, this is how they feel. You get everything from your words. You go, oh, you can go back and go to the, you can go into the middle of the script. You can go, oh yeah, that, and then put the pieces together, create stuff out of that. You've got the words to tell you, you know, or, and you just upgrade people's choices. Easy, you know, but what they say in dance, they dance. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, but there's like 10 minutes of music. So, um, okay, and then, the director just says you're wrong so i sort of loved that challenge you know the fact that you had to come up with a a story that progressed the story to the next scene and that's what i always did i bridged the gap so i always look at the scene sorry don't go no no, i look at the scene that the director has directed and then i try and emulate the choreographer in the same style as the director so it's seamless i think that was you know, the first thing I learned. And that's sort of where I came to blows with some directors and had to, had no choice but to become a director myself. Yeah. Because some scenes just weren't uh, being fulfilled you know, with potential in order to go into dance or song. And that's the problem, you know, you have to, song is heightened, mm. you know, form of expression and dance is even more heightened. You know, they say, if you can't say it, sing it. If you can't sing it, dance it, you know, and, and, and dance transcends any sort of language, you know, any form of language. And that's why I think Strictly Come Dancing has gone to 56 countries worldwide, you know, because dance is a thing that's in us, you know, and even as an actor, you're dancing. Mm-hmm. No matter whether you like it or not, you're singing as well, you know, because the lines themselves, I mean, Shakespeare is a perfect example, uh, you know, where there's a, you know, some sort of rhythm to it, you know, and, and everything has a rhythm, everything has a song, you know, and that's, that's what's wonderful about it. And that's what I loved. I just loved the whole going from a scene into a song, into a dance, back into a scene and trying to develop, you know, a wonderful arc and take people on the, a journey that they least expect. Yeah. Because I think and I've never done anything in a normal fashion. <laughs> I remember on I remember on Strictly when I was doing some coaching and I got Gavin Henson and I phoned you up and I said, "What do I do with him?" And you went, "Good luck, darling." Good luck, darling. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Sorry. Um, yeah. your process. Your process in the room. Uh, it's not. I don't think it's unusual, but I think I think it's something that's very specific to you in that you love to create within the room rather than do a lot of, of prep work. It's much more important for you to work with the artists you're working with. Can you yeah. just explain that a bit more? I mean, Guys and Dolls, I know you, the, the story you've got about sitting down, you're rocking the boat, it's hilarious. Oh, that was horrendous. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was loving Guys and Dolls up until the point I had to do sit down, you're rocking the boat because this was in Sheffield at the Crucible Theatre, which is a challenge because it's in the round. Well, it's three-sided. Uh, it's sit down, you're rocking the boat has always been done as a cross arch thing, yeah. you know, in a, in a sort of church, you know, a speakeasy, but set up very much like a church. And in that, you know, everything works in waves. And I thought it's so well written and so well scripted for just a normal setup, but I couldn't do a normal setup in the round. So I went, how can I do this? And I was just, I was bashing my head against a brick wall because I don't sit at home and write things down. 
you know, uh, some people like to do that. Stephen Meir, for instance, likes to write all his counts down. He likes to get a whole, you know, concept, the choreography pre, you know, done and stuff like that. I just can't do it that way. I like to uh, free fall and land either, you know, splat or with something amazing. And I was, I was at home and I thought, oh, I'll try and, I'll try and work something out on paper. That was, that, that took me until about three in the morning. Then I couldn't sleep because I had, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, you're back in the box, sit down. You know, it's like a brilliant build. There's meant to wave after wave. Everyone's get, meant to jump on their feet in the audience and scream more, more, more. I thought, I have to deliver this number. And I was literally, had my earphones in, listening to the number, listening to the number. It wasn't helping me because I knew the number. I thought, what am I doing? I'm going mad. And literally, uh, we did good morning, everyone. We did the company warm up. I still had no clue what I was going to do with the number <laughs> and how I was going to do it. No clue. And I just walked into the middle of the room and I just went, I've got to do with a deck doll here. That's Declan Donnan. Empty my head. Let the space take me. So I just literally walked into the middle after the call was happening because I had three with the number on its feet. And no other time. I mean, there was no other time in the scheduling to do this. No, okay. I'm just going to fall backwards on my back and see what happens. I did that. And then something came to me. I went, it's the round. Let's do it in the round. <laughs> so I put all the chairs in a circle and did everything coming in and coming out. And I was awake. I was loving it. <laughs> I had the number up in his feet, uh, literally in an hour. But it wasn't until I emptied my head yeah. and stopped fearing the idea of it and stopped being scared and just opened my mind to anything that it happened. And that's the same in acting. It's the same in yeah. singing. It's the same, you know, it, it's what stops people is fear. And fear, actually, you learn in the end, does not exist. Yeah. It really doesn't exist. You know, you're just only, like, you think you might look stupid, but so what? You know, who cares? I mean, that's what I encourage people to be, like three-year-olds in the, in the room. And the reason I don't uh, do everything at home or come in with absolutely no idea. I have a concept, I have a vision, but I don't know how I'm going to do it or achieve it. And, and I rely heavily on all of us in the room to create it because then not only do you come up with something you've never thought of, uh, the actors own it. Yes. It becomes theirs. And eventually that has to happen. Yes. You know, the director, Koroba, has to let go of the material and the actor has to love that character, has to love the words that they're saying and has to be responsible to own it, you know, and to, and to embrace it and take it somewhere else. And of it also, their creativity. It, it also helps that very difficult moment, I think, particularly when you're doing a long run, where you very often don't discover something until three, four, five months into the run, long well, after the original. Sometimes years, are they? You know, nobody's there. Because yeah, I've gone back to Hannigan and I thought, ah, oh, after six months. I went, you know, I did it for the yeah, yeah, yeah. 2015 and 16, then I had a year off, and then I came back into the West End and I went, oh, you know, like bells were going off because I was thinking, that's what that moment's about. Yes. Why didn't I think of it then? You know, it's very odd, isn't it? But um, yeah, you need time to digest it. And plus you need to be organic and let it grow. And especially in things like Annie, if you're just militant or, you know, acting by numbers in a military way and do the same line and not listen to anyone, the same line, the same way, at the same speed, at the same tempo every single time, then uh, you're not going to actually have a scene at all because scene is all about as we know you know acting and reacting yes. listening to other actors and adjusting and being in the moment and uh my point to that story was the fact that you're working with kids yeah and they're always different <laughs> i mean there wasn't one show i think that i ever did or ever, you know with or one week i ever did with the same annie i mean in my first week i went through seven annies <laughs> My first seven week, seven Annies. I mean, every day was another Annie. And in one show, I did, I had three Annies. Yeah. I started with one, then another one just appeared. <laughs> and then, uh, then the curtain came in, because one of them had wet themselves on stage. And then, 
Then the, the third one appeared and I went, oh my God. Here we go. You know, so you have to be open to it. And plus they'll be making blunders or they'll, yeah. they'll be saying something else. So you have to listen to them. And that always kept me on my toes and always kept it organic. And you have to remember that the audience are seeing it for the first time as well. I mean, I've been in shows where, you know, I, Saigon, you know, you've got to look up like that lame is. Oh, you know, Javert's got to look to God at that point and then down. I mean, it's very, you know, by numbers and the way they want it, the way the producers want it, the way the director wants it. But um, I don't like working like that. I leave the work open for interpretation because then you find something wonderful, you know, with your cast and you're using your cast. You're not making them uh, a chess set yeah. where you're just pushing them around and say it like this, do it like that. You know, it's, it's their responsibility to come up with material and it puts pressure as much on me as them to come up with stuff in the room. And that's where the fun is, you know, whether it be right or wrong, it doesn't matter. In rehearsals, there is no right and there is no wrong. In life, there is no right or wrong in that way. We're constantly improvising in life. So why can't it be like that? Just because we've got a script, for instance, doesn't mean, you know, you have to say it the same way each time. You know, I think it's, you have to know what the character wants, all of that Stanislavski stuff, you know, which I studied which I was interested in, you know, when I was a kid, yeah. when I was like trying to be an actor in that way. But um, I just um, love it. I love being in the rehearsal room. It's my most favorite period of time, you know, and, and plus it's the funny stuff, you know, and out of something absurd could come amazing truth. And I think, you know, that's what I always try yeah. and get that. I it said, well, It was really interesting. I did, um, I, did, uh, I did Annie with Lily Savage. And uh, Martin Shannon, who wrote Annie, as you know, directed. That. Oh, how was that? Was it oh, Lily Savage or was it? No, it was Lily Savage as Miss Hannigan. I mean, yeah, that's what I mean. Before. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. And, and what I found really fantastic was Martin was saying it's the truest performance. Why have we never had this role played by a man before? It's the truest <laughs> performance we got of, of that character. And what I loved when you played Hannigan, which I, I adored, I adored what you did with it. Thank you. What I really loved, and it goes on to sort of celebrity and social media in a sense, was that very, very quickly, I forgot this was Craig Revel Horwood. It was Miss Hannigan. And that was a, yeah. it was a great compliment to any artist. I forgot who it was. But of course, it must be quite difficult, particularly with social media. We look at Joe Sarg having done so well on Strictly and then gone into yeah. a musical. How does, that, how does that sort of celebrity and social media world affect you? particularly when you're playing a character and you want to be, you don't want to be Craig, I want to be Hannigan. You know, how does that, yeah. how does that work? It must be quite difficult. It's, it is difficult. It is because people want to see me, not the character. And it's my responsibility to obviously let them forget me and, uh, and invest, you know, in that character. Hannigan, I was worried about. I've got to be honest, when I thought about it, I thought, oh, I'd love to. But I don't want to. I don't want to play it as a drag queen. I don't want to play it like I would the Wicked Queen in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs in Panto. Uh, I had to invest. Obviously, I can't uh, break the fourth wall, and I can't become Craig Rebel Hallwood and do a fabulous. Or uh, and plus, I had to have an accent, you know, which is pretty much unrecognisable. And uh, and I wanted to play her for truth, play her for real. I wanted her to be a real woman. And now I think it's important that we're all actors. We're no longer, you're not an actress or an actor anymore. Ever, you know, women fought for the right to be called actors so they could play more, you know, compelling roles. Yeah. And even the roles of men. You know, I know there was a big hoo-ha when, when I was given the role saying, oh, it's just, it's gone to a bloke just for promotional purposes. And it's gone to a celebrity, which is even worse. You know, someone that doesn't sing or act, you know, why would you get someone like that? You know, so there was a lot of that going on. I'm, and apparently I was taking the jobs of, you know, the best female roles for middle-aged women. Well, I'm sorry, but a lot of middle-aged women are taking the roles of men as well. And plus, guess what? We're all called actors. So I'm, my, in my defence and into the defence of anyone that wants to cross genders or um, race, religion, anything like that, I think it's good. We are actors and that's what we're there to do. Whether you're playing a man, a woman, a transsexual, a sex change, or, you know, there's a lot of women that play uh, men that have had the operation, you know, so it's, 
it's up for grabs and may the best actor win the day, you know? So it was really nice to be able to go on and prove that number one, I could sing. Number two, I can still dance a bit, but I mean, Hannigan's drunk or hung over in every scene, which I absolutely loved, <laughs> you know, it was great. And the difference between her and Panto is I do play the Panto women as women, because I'm never a dame. I'm yeah. always playing a woman's role in Panto. Uh, but I come out of character all the time to be Craig Revel Hallward for the audience. But you see, you know, that's the beauty about Panto, that you can break that fourth wall yeah. and you can drop character. You can, you know, corpse. I mean, you know, obviously the corpsing uh, is instructed. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> yeah most of the time so you get a good old laugh on that you know but still it's uh it's great fun doing both you know but i like the challenge of not being able to change the words not being able to improvise and um and actually being able to you know not do the character a disservice ultimately you know so i think that's a good thing Another one. Can I answer your question? I have no, no idea. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, another one of your challenges, which is something that you're really passionate about, is actor musicianship. And of course, we've got an amazing yeah. actor musician course. Um, what is it about actor musicianship that you you're so so much in love with? Because it is a, it's a very defined um, sort of piece of theatre, isn't it? They know they're an ensemble. Yeah. That is the most important thing. There are no stars. They all have to do something. They have to be an orchestra. So they're always listening. They're trained to listen to one another, whether it be instrumentally or whether it be in the scenes. You know, it, it, it goes on into those scenes as well, which I think is fantastic. That's, I was nervous of it to begin with at the Watermill. I did a show called The Hot Mercado and that was my first actor musicians. And I have to say, I sat in the room have you you've been to the Walls Mill? Obviously. I love it. It's one of my favourite yeah. places. Yeah, I love it too. But uh, we were rehearsing in the shed, you know, and there were 12 actors with huge big instruments in the space. And I was going, clutter! Clutter! I said, can't we drop some of the instruments? <laughs> you know, I couldn't get my head around it. I was thinking, this is absolutely ridiculous. And then I thought, Actually, they make such a wonderful sound. It'd be so nice to have all of them on stage all mm. the time mm. and to see where the music's coming yeah. from and tell a story with each instrument. So that was a double challenge, you know, not only getting their acting skills honed into telling stories and connecting with one another, but letting the instruments speak for themselves and letting the instruments become part of the play. Yeah. Uh, instead of just being an accessory, because that's what I hate, you know, is, or, or putting people up the back just to play the music as a band while someone's acting down the front. I never do that. You know, I will make sure that that flute is going to be used to kill someone or I'll use the trombone slide to stab someone in the back, you know, or I'll use the bow to, you know, um, on a, a, like in... Uh, witches of Eastwick, you know, uh, using the bow uh, as a sexual pleasure. <laughs> uh, and it's amazing, really. I mean, I, it opened my mind and I fell in love with it enough to do seven years at the Watermill and just, oh my God, it was amazing. And that's why I have great respect for them because a lot of them play five instruments as well. But of course, actors now are all thinking, oh God, everything's actor muso, I need to play an instrument. I mean, that's not entirely true, you know, all the time. It depends what you want to do. It does help to have an understanding of music, to be able to read dots and to have an instrument up your sleeve. So I would encourage any student, even if it's just in the background, to learn at least something, you yeah. know, because it does actually connect you to a lot of material. And even if you're doing classical acting, you've still got to dance. You've still got to play a penny whistle or some sort of instrument, you know, a lyre, or you'll, you'll, you'll end up playing something in a Shakespearean drama. You know, so um, it's really useful and handy to have something up your sleeve. Amazing.
Um, I'm well aware of time and we haven't even got on to some student questions. So I'd love to, to oh, do... Oh, I, I can shorten my answers. Quick fire. We'll do some quick fire uh, questions on them. But there's a little bit of Strictly. We haven't done a lot of Strictly because I know, you, I think you call it your Saturday job, you know. And you, there's so well, it is. Yeah, <laughs> it's easy. I hold paddles literally from one to ten. You've got them there. Oh, blind. <laughs> Um, so, t look, Tess is asking, it's not the Tess, I hope, um, on Strictly, who's your favourite celebrity contestant and who would, should have won but didn't? Okay, my favourite celebrity contestant, I think, was Mark Rambakash because he couldn't dance at all. Yeah. And he was a cricketer and came in and was absolutely hopeless on Thursday, useless. Friday would forget absolutely everything. But Saturday, boom, something snapped and, and he was on. And I went, oh my God, he's actually dancing. And um, so he's one of my favourites. I like that type of contestant, you know, that's he never done it before. Yeah, and um, well, he did win. Uh, who, should, who should have won? I think Debbie McGee was a person that I would love to have won. And I think should have, because um, I think it's because she's not a woman, not getting the votes. You know, I mean, she got to the final and all of that. She's amazing, absolutely wonderful, and I love her. And she, I think she's a person that should have won. Amazing. Uh, from Viv, um, you've recently got engaged to Jonathan. Congratulations. Uh, will we ever see a same-sex couple on Strictly? Yes. This year? <laughs> I'm hoping. Fingers yeah, I think, I think, well, we're hoping, yeah. Fingers crossed they will do it this year. I mean, I think they have to. I mean, the problem is with COVID, you know, there is that situation now. But, um, but yeah, I think they really want to. So I think that's in, in the ballpark. Fantastic. Uh, this is from Morgan. What have been your dance disasters, darling? He says. Uh, <laughs> there's been a lot. I did, uh, when I was 16, I was in uh, Am Jam Show and I was doing a dance number to Johnny Be Good, and I was going up and out and up and out and finishing it, finishing it in the split. Went down, went boom, ripped my hamstring. Had to, yeah, waddle off. It waddle wasn't good. <laughs> uh, this is from Peter, who's one of our, our new first year uh, musical theatre students. After you achieved your, oh, sorry, after you achieved your dream of performing on the West End, what new dreams and goals did you develop and how did they influence the work that then, uh, then came your way? I wanted to become, after I finished in the West End, obviously I wanted to direct, uh, I achieved that. And then I thought, oh, I really want to get into film. So I've been dabbling in a little bit of film. Uh, I, I want to direct film, but I think that's going to be later in my life. At the moment, I just seem to be appearing in them. Or, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, or I'm playing the baddie, sort of typecast in a way, camp baddie. Uh, but I got to do Paddington, which was a dream yeah, come true. And I always wanted to choreograph something on celluloid that was going to be there forever, because as we know in the theatre, it's it's there and it's gone you know and people don't always remember it. so it's nice to be like a fossey have your work sort of there for everyone forever and um yeah that's still a dream yeah uh this is ella who's another new first year once you're out of training what is your inv your advice on how to keep your passion going and not lose your drive optimism seems to be from your stories it's yeah i think um love the rejection learn to love it think oh oh, that's good, yeah, I've been rejected. They don't want me for that, but they might want me for this. And just think that when that door closes, another one will open that's probably 10 times better for you. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think uh, keep training is one of the most important things because that will inspire you. Do something that you're really shit at. If you're a terrible tap dancer, go and do tap classes. It'll occupy your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if your ballet is terrible, um, go and do ballet. If you can't do a waltz and you'll need to in every single show, no matter who you are, whether you're an actor or whether you're a straight actor, it doesn't matter. You always, actors always have to dance and then freak out. So um, instead of freaking out, go and have some training and enjoy it. You know, enjoy the challenge of learning something new, even if you are terrible at it. But I tell you what, if you do do that, then you won't be as terrible as you would have been <laughs> if you go to an audition and they suddenly say, oh, right, we'd like to do the uh, dance combination now. And then, of course, the actor freaks out. Because I generally get people to do a double turn just to see if they've had training. So, I mean, if you want to cheat my auditions, 
make sure you can whip off a double <laughs> cleanly and then I'll believe you had training. <laughs> That's a good cheat. It's a good cheat. Um, I love your auditions. You know, go to everything. Yeah. You well, never know. I was going to ask you about auditions. This, this is from Josh. You've sat on both sides of the audition table. Yeah. What have you learned as a creative about auditions that you wish you'd known as an actor? Oh, that they're on your side. They're, they're desperate and hungry for you to be fantastic. You know, and right, they don't know, the creatives don't know generally what they're looking for, unless they're just doing a, a replacement. Mm. Or you've got to fit the costume, which is, you know, very rare these days. But um, yeah, don't be scared of them. They're your friends. They're there to love, nurture, embrace, and make it nice for you. You know, I, I always make everyone's audition as much fun as I possibly can so they can leave having a really nice experience and leave learning something about themselves that they had no idea about themselves you know or what they can do uh, push yourself and and actually give the director a take on something you know don't be shy about um uh, about what you're putting behind it what acting you know you're putting behind it i think uh, you have to come in with a really broad concept of it. Go in and be prepared for the director to oppose that entirely and go the opposite way. Yeah. You know, don't ever think that your way is the right way because that's a lot of actors uh, have worked on their acting, you know, worked on their, their set pieces that they come in to do. And that's the only way they can do them. As soon as I say, oh, actually, you're a three-year-old kid and you've actually got a knife and you want to kill your mother can you play the scene now like that with the intention that you're threatening your mother and you're eventually going to kill her you know just to upset the apple cart that's yeah, only yeah. to see number one if they can take direction and how creative they're going to be in the room you have to be prepared to put yourself on the line nothing's easy nothing's fair nothing but it should be fun you know yeah. go in and be like a child have games play with it if you want to throw yourself on the floor throw yourself on the floor you know the director will say uh would you mind doing that without throwing yourself on the floor maybe but at least you've offered something yeah I think that's the important thing because i'm constantly going oh that poor person so full of fear that they haven't offered anything really they've just done what they've been trained to do and uh then i have to sort of strip that away and then give them something else to play you know to see whether or not they can change or whether they're just locked into that. So don't ever lock yourself into one idea of what that particular play is about, because you never know. Yeah. And plus, you know, you, you want to be creative in this business. You don't want to be a robot. No. In actor, sorry, this is Marcus. In actor musician projects specifically, what combina a combination of instruments do you find the most useful in the audition process? That's a good question. Um, well, definitely piano is always good to have, but not particularly useful. So it's great to have that, but that means you're stuck at a piano. Yeah. And I always run into the problem where I need people moving, walking, talking, playing. So I would, I would say sax, clarinet, anything that you can walk around with. Double bass is a bit tricky because I've had to put wheels on them or I've had to leave them there or they have to lift them up. But uh, we need them <laughs> obviously as well but uh, the best ones flute clarinet things that have if you if you want to get a good job and have like um have the melody lines and all of that then flute's really great to have and that's easy to chuck in your handbag and also um trumpet's quite good to do because you can move around with that uh anything that you can walk talk and play is a really good instrument to yeah. have um, Sarah Travis, who you've worked with an awful lot, uh, yeah. on lots of projects, I remember her saying that um, a wind brass combination is really rare and that's incredibly valuable if you can... If you oh can yeah, wind, wind and brass always, yeah. Right, really, really useful. Uh, from... Uh, I'm just looking at the ones that we may have answered. What advice would you give someone who is looking to make the transition from a dancer to a choreographer? That's from Finn. Uh, basically, start practicing <laughs> and you know just say yes to any choreographic gigs yeah and see how you go and develop your own language i think that's it uh be brave just be brave 
don't enter the space, you know, chattering your teeth and biting your nails. Enter the space like you know what's going on and just let it take you and be free of mind. Don't think, oh, I have to do this, I have to do that, because that will stop your creativity. Yeah. So you walk into a room, no matter who it is, it could be just two people, it could be one person, and just practice on people and offer yourself up. You know, like, don't sit back. I think you have to offer yourself. If someone says, oh, I really need to get a choreographer, they say, I'll do it. You know, that's what I did to start. And, um, you know, I did it for a bottle of wine once to show up at the um, Hampstead Theatre. So that was sort of good. <laughs> You know, I've got to work with like, really fantastic actors, but they need a little bit of this. You know, that's a good way to start is by helping actors explore, you know, movement. That always works really, really well. And then that will develop your skills to tell stories in dance rather than, I'll oh, do a step ball change, part of the way here and go into one of those ponches here, you know, and finish with, I don't know, recover from the ponche, darling, preparation, triple pirouette split. You know, you don't want that. You want to, there's got to be a reason. So always think through story, don't always choreograph it, just tell the story first and then add the steps later. That's what I do. Maddie, you've had so many roles on and off the stage and screen. Uh, if you could pick just one, I think she means roles as in all the jobs you've done. Yeah. Uh, if you could pick just one, which role has taught you the most and which has challenged you the most? Um, the one that taught me the most was uh, doing a project that I didn't necessarily want to do, and I called them vanity pieces. Where, for instance, the producer is paying for the husband or wife to star in it, who is not particularly talented. And then your job is basically uh, taking the money and trying to make something of it. <laughs> that is the most soul destroying thing. And that's taught me never to do it again. I've done two in my life and they've been a complete and absolute disaster. <laughs> so uh, I can, uh, but it taught me never to do it again. And it taught me always uh, have a passion about the piece you want to do or that you're doing and not to accept it just for money because that will never work out or just uh, to help someone that's less fortunate out. <laughs> you know? It doesn't work, it doesn't pay off and plus you won't have a good time and it'll be horrible and you won't earn any money out of it anyway because it'll be a pile of cack. Three more quick ones. Taylor, what is your master chef, master chef signature dish? Oh yeah, I love doing that show. That was back in 2007. My signature dish is at home, a lasagna. And I, not just any old lasagna. Lasagna I love because it's a seafood lasagna. That's what I love. It's just beautiful seafood. You can put spinach in it, blah, 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 gorgeous. Also, um, I like making pastries and cheesy pastries. So uh, I do love a good quiche, bizarrely. But I mean, we call them little tartlets or whatever in the posh business. You know, but, um, <laughs> it's basically a quiche with prawns. I love that. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Uh, Amy, is your wax work, wax works in Blackpool as good as the real thing? No, of course not. I oh, do talk. Oh, darling. We... I do talk. I mean, I, I had my wax work made and uh, it was before I was doing Hannigan. Then I went back for a resurface or something, a skin match. And then they went, oh my God, you've lost so much weight. I had to shave like an inch off. <laughs> I was loving it. I said, darling, that, that, that uh, whack works a bit fat, isn't it? <laughs> so um, yeah, they got rid of it. And that was great. Yeah, no, it was a fantastic experience. Nowhere near as good, but identical. I mean, it is identical. It freaked my family out. My mum. Because they saw my head going past and my body doing this. Because then they put the head on later. And my head was in a box. It was like, it was very Norma Desmond. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Finally, we have a plea from Mackenzie. Please, please, please get revenge on Michael McIntyre for his midnight game show prank. 
That was awful. I had a donkey coming up my driveway, for goodness sakes. I mean, it was horrible. And plus I'd been recording, um, I'd been recording my album as well, that uh, I'd been recording one of the songs from it. So I was absolutely shattered. <laughs> Got home, went to bed at 11.30 and they lie, it wasn't midnight at all. It was one o'clock in the morning. And of course they all stayed until four in the morning and then I had to work the next day at nine o'clock. So I mean, no rest for the wicked, they say, but a laugh. It was funny. It's a nightmare, isn't it? Um, you've got some lovely things coming up as we as we begin to wrap up now. Yeah. Um, you've got your your new novel coming out, your first novel coming out. Yeah, uh, my first ever novel. Yeah. Dances and Dreams, I think it's called. Dances and Dreams on Diamond Street. It's basically a lot of leftover pages that I changed and changed all the characters to, <laughs> so, and then made the stories a lot better because I had because I've done three autobiographies and a couple of dance books and all of that. And uh, I thought, well, I've got all of these wonderful stories inside me that have really actually happened and yeah. so many funny things to tell. I just thought it'd be great uh, to do a work of fiction. So, uh, because you can say anything you like, you know, and you don't have to go, you don't actually then, I don't have to go to the BBC and say, oh, can I say this thing? Or well, I don't have to like, communicate with anyone about it. I don't have to do a law, you know, thing. Normally I have hundreds of lawyers sort of going through all my pages saying, you can't, that's liable, that's liable. You can't say that about that person. Or you can't tell the truth about that person. No, you know, so it's really difficult. So it was wonderful to have the freedom to write finally a novel and to include, you know, the stories that were not included in all my autos because of um, they were either a bit too saucy or they weren't for an audience, you know, so it was really nice to uh, do that. And it's set in Camden Town in the 90s. Yeah. yeah, where I lived, basically, but I've just changed um, Pratt Street to Diamond Street. <laughs> That's an insight. <laughs> but uh, yeah, really good fun. And I encourage everyone to do it. Everyone's got a bit of a novel in them. I mean, you know, I'm, You've got, most people have had so many wonderful experiences and you can make all the rest up. It's yeah. just fantastic being free to make stuff up and get it down, you know, okay. I love it. Uh, and then you've got a new duet album coming out with one of your singers, oh, yeah. with Rietta. Yeah, with Rietta, we're doing yeah. that. And that's, you know, why lockdown was really, really good. Uh, and I've really enjoyed it. You know, we're trying to get this Christmas single out at the moment as well. I've recorded it, but it was a bit sort of strictified, if you like, a bit too strictly based. And the lawyers said, ah, nah, you can't do that. So um, we're changing the lyrics <laughs> and putting it out anyway. See, nothing can stop you. Don't ever be defeatist. Don't let anyone, you know, if they say, oh, you can't release that because of this word. And I'll say, all right, I'll change the word. You know, okay, we're still releasing it. So don't let anyone say you can't do stuff. Well, yeah, that's what I'd love to finish on, sort of your, your top three things you could say to the students and, and just about their future careers, what you would... Yeah, um, well, when I had body dysmorphia and anorexia and all that, I always said, you know, that I would teach myself a lesson like later on in life. And I sort of did. And I think that's really important that if you're suffering with anything like that, to um, always consider not to compare yourself to other people. That's what led to my destruction as a dancer. And I was constantly in the mirror saying to myself, why can't my hips be smaller like his? Why have I not got a square set of pecs? Why am I round? Why haven't I got abs like the guy next door who eats everything? You know, and I ended up starving myself. It was ridiculous. And ended up looking in the mirror and seeing things that actually weren't even there because I was constantly comparing myself to someone else. Celebrate who you are, celebrate your own body and what it has to offer. Yeah, I had big hits. You know what? I made it as a drag queen because they look bloody beautiful <laughs> in drag. You know, I'm never gonna be you know, a strippogram, but <laughs> you know, I, I made use of what I had eventually. And so I learned a lesson, a valuable lesson there. So don't compare yourself, you are unique and celebrate that. I think that's so important. Um, continue to study is my other thing. If you get a job, don't just stop dancing or don't just stop acting classes. Don't stop improv. That is one of the most important things as an actor, that you're really great at improv. A lot of movies now, like for instance, Antivity, um, Mike Lee only does improv and it's up to the actor, if you're playing a lawyer, to become a lawyer before you come into the room. <clears throat> because he won't give you any lines to say. 
No, no one does. I mean, you have to improvise and you never know what scene you're going to be in. So my, my point on that note is to continue studying always. There's always something else you can learn. Um, don't be afraid of failure is another thing. I think people are so scared of failing that they forget what they're doing. You yeah. know, they forget, you know, and don't have like a Shirley McCain out of body experience that a lot of people experience in auditions and in performance that only leads to, um, but by that I'll explain just Shirley um, MacLaine, traveling outside your body and looking at yourself and thinking what other people on the panel or the audience are thinking about you doing what you're doing. You're then out of character, you're out of the moment and you'll never be free. And that, um, I know I've, that's happened to me and uh, that led to stage fright, which was absolutely awful. And where I was speechless, I couldn't move my body and had to be taken literally off stage. And that was through a Danny LaRue show where I had to ask one question and I couldn't remember the question. I had the questions put up in the wings. I went off the stage, I read it, I came back on and I froze. And it was the ugliest thing ever. And now I know why I was doing it. I was having a Shirley MacLaine, an out of body experience. I was judging myself from up there, from the gods looking down. And that's crazy. Be in the moment and you'll never ever experience that. Mm. I think that's it. Plenty <laughs> <laughs> of other advice, darling. Oh, well, I know we could go on for hours, but I know hours. We, uh, we're out of time. But thank you so, so much for your time, your stories, your huge, generous heart that you have. Well, um, can, can I just say this about Mount View? Mm. That I think the students that, I'm, that come to me for auditions from Mount View are so professional. Yeah, it's cool. a fantastic place for actors, um, singers, dancers, and of course, actor musos to train. It's absolutely phenomenal. And it's apparent in the work, their work, work ethic when they come into the room with me. And uh, it's refreshing. So oh. enjoy your time there. Make the most of it. Don't fritter it away. It's a very, very short period of time you're there. So you have to use everybody, you know, including you, Mr. Neil, to, um, you know, learn as much as you possibly can. And don't give up. There's nothing worse than people not trying. So no, don't give up. Enjoy yourself. Make something. Thank you so much. Your spirit is infectious and gorgeous and lovely. And thank you for spending time with us. Uh, I've loved it. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Uh, to the rest of you. Thank you for watching. Hope you've had fun, or we've had fun. Uh, I look forward to seeing you back in Peckham very, very soon, and take care of yourself. See you. Bye-bye. I was very green. I didn't have any theatre background at all. No one I knew had ever been involved in this world, in the world of the arts and everything. And so I sort of assumed I couldn't be in it. I don't come from a wealthy background. I don't come from a place where I could finance myself to go through the training. Young people who want to have training have to take other work and other job. I think it's a huge strain on young people. I did a 13 hour shift every Saturday at a nursing agency. If you weren't born into it or didn't know about it, how do you get in? I just was willing to do anything to do this thing that I loved. Peter Cox said, founded Mount View out of an experience he had during the army. In 1945, he was denied access to the officers' drama club, so he started his own drama club for the lesser ranks and then brought that back to London whereby he established a theatre club in his own house. He wanted to have a theatre club, um, a place where people could come throughout the community and work on scenes and plays and songs. And it was very much a community organisation which then grew and grew and grew and grew. The Judy Dench Fund is 
singularly the most important thing for Mount View at the present time. We need artists from each and every area of our community to tell the stories that reflect contemporary life. We must be training people from every walk of life, from every culture and from every socio-economic background. I think it will help outreach to different communities and people of different backgrounds to give them an opportunity to really come to the forefront and really help further our industry. It's about creating opportunity and it's about creating access. It's investing in the arts for the future. You can concentrate on what you really, really want to concentrate on, which is rolling your sleeves up and learning your craft. It will just break the limitations of what has been potential and what has been possible before, because we've got an array of voices, a diverse range of people, really making the best of the best art. Talent doesn't discriminate. Training needs to be accessible for everyone. This fund at this time is the keystone to the future health of our industry. Thank you for supporting the Judy Dench Fund. It's one of the most rewarding things you will ever do. Thank you. Thank you so much for supporting the Judy Dench Fund. You'll be helping so many young people find their way in the arts and make their life there. And that, after all, was Peter Coxhead's dream. Thank you so much.